Hey everyone, welcome to Great Lakes Church. My name is Carson, and I gotta tell you before we get into our weekly message that we're a community of people helping people find and follow Jesus. We're based out of Southeast Wisconsin. We have physical locations in Kenosha, Racine, but if you're listening to this or watching this, you've found our online presence. We share content on our YouTube and our podcast platforms wherever you listen, and we love that you're a part. If you want to know more about what's going on here at Great Lakes Church, you can find out more at greatlakeschurch.com or check out our central hub. But until then, everything you need is going to be in the description. So enjoy the message and we'll catch you next time. Happy Mother's Day. Today we are celebrating moms. You may already know this, but my mama shows up to Great Lakes Church every single week. All right, so does my dad, but today we honor moms and... Uh, my parents have been a huge part of our church since the beginning. We actually launched in their house, right? They allowed us to meet in the living room to kind of share vision, cast vision, and then they quickly came along and said, hey, we're going to be a part of this. But because it's Mother's Day, I want you to know my mom shows up every single Wednesday night to attend service, but also every Sunday morning to serve. And what most people don't know is when she shows up on Sunday morning, she parks far away so that other people can park close. Let me tell you something. We always need moms in our life, don't we? And when they are gone, yeah, absolutely. And, and when they're no longer with us, there is something deeply missed. So what I want to do today is I just want to start by pausing and praying and thanking God for our moms. Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us and for blessing us with mothers, for giving us someone to love us and care for us and nurture us. And I know that's not everyone's story. And so where there is pain, we just pray for healing. I do pray today for those who... Find Mother's Day to be a day of uh, difficulty. Uh, they've lost their moms. I, I pray in, in those situations that you would bring peace and comfort for those who are mourning the loss of a child today through maybe it was miscarriage or death. We pray that your presence would be felt. For mothers struggling with the challenges of parenting, uh, struggling maybe with blending a family together, we pray for wisdom. For those who have experienced a delayed adoption or uh, a failed adoption, for those whose heart is broken, they've experienced infertility, we ask that you'd bring comfort. For those wanting to be a mother but are experiencing challenges and they've been unable to be a mother to this point, we pray miraculously in the next year, work, intervene, and uh, give these great women the desire of their heart. But we do, we thank you for moms in every single stage of life and uh, for giving us the gift of moms to love us and to care for us. Uh, we pray blessings on them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, on March 27th, 1977, there were two fully loaded Boeing 747 jumbo jets that crashed on the runway of the Los Rodeos Airport on the small island of Tenerife, which is off the coast of West Africa. And it resulted in the worst aviation disaster in history. So anytime there's a disaster like this, you know that an investigation uh, needs to happen. And during the investigation, it was determined that there wasn't a single factor. There were actually multiple factors that contributed to this. One of the factors was that a nearby airport had a bomb go off. Uh, it was a terrorist type of deal. And so planes were being uh, diverted to Tenerife. So it was busier than usual. Uh, on top of that, there was uh, problems with radio interference. And so uh, one of the pilots was having difficulty understanding exactly what they were supposed to do. Uh, then, of course, there's human error involved, uh, miscommunication between the planes, miscommunication between the pilots and air traffic control. But one of the biggest factors on that particular day was there was heavy fog that had settled in. And, and the Los Rodeos, uh, Rodeos Airport um, does not have ground tracking radar, and so... Uh, air traffic control was having a really difficult time because they didn't know where the planes were. They couldn't see them because of the fog. Um, and the fog made it impossible for one aircraft to see the other. And so what happened is that eventually one of the captains uh, of, of, of one of the planes decided they were going to take off. It's possible they misunderstood from radio interference, but it's, it's unclear exactly what happened. But they decided they were going to take off even though they didn't have clearance to do so. Because of the fog they couldn't see the other airplane on the runway. And so they're almost full speed as they're taken off. And of course they collide. 583 people end up losing their lives. Now what makes 
this story even more interesting is that the control tower did not even see the explosion. They heard it. They knew something was wrong, so they send out uh, uh, you know, people, the rescue crews to, uh, to, to help, and the rescue crews make their way to the first plane. Because of the fog, they don't even realize there's a second plane. So they're trying to help survivors. It was 20 minutes before they realized there was another plane involved. And so it was just a horrific, horrific uh, event that unfolded. Now, you don't need me to convince you of this, but we are living at a time period in history where there is so much going on, right? We are so busy. Our lives are so packed with stuff that it does feel at times like we're living in a fog, like we're mentally exhausted, we're emotionally exhausted. And so I want to talk about that today, right? Last week, we kicked off this series called Whack-A-Mole. And uh, I'm guessing everybody knows what Whack-A-Mole is, right? This arcade game that has all of these moles that pop up. Sometimes they pop up uh, simultaneously, but certainly when they pop up, it's at different speeds throughout the game. And the objective is to strike them down with a mallet, right? So just for fun, it's like uh, I, I am talking to kids today, but I have my mallet and I have my mole, right? Yeah, even, even a little bit of noise, right? But, but this is what I want to talk about today. Because in this series, uh, what we're doing is we're looking at some of the moles, some of the issues in this life that just pop up over and over and over, often at the same time. And if we do not strike them down, they have the potential to wreak havoc and destruction on our lives. Now, I'm intentionally using this word strike down, right? And here's why. These are not things that we're ever going to fully defeat. These are not things that we're going to fully overcome, right? I'm not talking about how to overcome them. I'm talking about how to strike them down because all of our lives, we're going to have to work uh, to keep them at bay. The apostle Paul, he actually alludes to this in a letter he writes to followers of Jesus in the first century. He says, stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. In other words, there's going to be moles popping up. There's going to be enemies popping up. There's going to be distractions popping up. You got to stand firm. A few verses later, he writes this. He says, resist the enemy in the time of evil. If he was writing to us today, it's possible he might say, pay attention to the moles of life. Now, here's the deal. What makes this so challenging is that the moles in this life, the enemies in this life, the problems and the issues in this life, they don't show up in obvious ways, right? They don't show up wearing a red cape and red spandex and carrying a pitchfork and horns coming off of their head. That's not how they show up, right? They show up in very subtle ways, which means that we don't even notice them. And because we don't notice them, it's very easy for them to make their way into our lives, eventually impacting our attitudes and our thinking and doing lots of destruction. So last week, we talked about how we have to pay attention to our hearts. We have to pay attention to things in this life that cause us to be disillusioned or to stop trusting people or uh, possibly to, um, that, that makes us critical of the world around us. We have to pay attention to those things. Otherwise, it will result in cynicism. And so today... What I want to do, last week was cynicism. Today, what I want to do is I want to talk about burnout, all right? And the reason I want to talk about this is some of the phrases that I hear most often used by people when I'm engaging in conversation, doesn't matter age, demographic, doesn't matter season of life, are phrases like, I'm so overwhelmed right now. I've got too much going on, right? It just feels like I'm running nonstop. I am exhausted. I hear it from people who are retired, I hear it from uh, people who are single parents. I hear it from people who are married. I hear it from people who are employed, others who are unemployed. It just feels like everybody is running on fumes all the time. And in many ways, our our life is like a balloon, right? Yeah, what happens with the balloon is it has a certain capacity. So if I keep blowing air into it, which I'm not going to do, eventually it's going to pop, right? It can't take all that pressure. And what happens when too much pressure is put on us for too long, we pop, we burn out. And there's lots of ways that we could define burnout, but this is probably my favorite definition. Burnout is when the demands placed on us exceed the resources within us. We all have different capacity, right? Some of us can go, 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 go for a very long time. We're not burned out. Why? Because the resources within us. Others have a limited capacity and that's okay, but we all have some sort of capacity. And burnout is when the demands placed on us exceed the resources within us. A lot of times, burnout is associated with stress, but it's different than stress. And the reason why is because generally speaking, stress is short-lived, right? Most of the time, stress is related like to a temporary project or an event. 
So if you have to give a big presentation and there's lots of important people in the room, eh, you're probably a little stressed. If you've got a test that you did not prepare for, you're stressed. If you have a new job and you have to learn a bunch of new skills, you get stressed. Right? If you have to move across the country, that's going to create stress. It's, there's a lot of things involved. But generally speaking, that stress is temporary. It's going to go away. Burnout is different. Burnout is a chronic type of stress that just feels like it's never ending. Feels like it's never going away. It's there week after week, month after month. No relief in sight. And if you live with burnout for too long, you just get to a point where you stop caring. You want to care, you just, you, you can't. You feel like a walking zombie, like you're dead inside. And the thing about burnout is it can happen at any age. And the reason why is because burnout is not about how long you live. It's about how you live. So burnout, not the same as stress, not the same as being tired, not the same as being worn out, right? Everybody gets tired, everybody gets stressed, everybody gets worn out. But those things are temporary. Burnout is often ongoing. So let's talk about some of the symptoms of burnout, right? One of the big symptoms of burnout is our inability to focus, right? You just lose your ability to think straight. Someone asks you a very simple question. It's like, ah, uh, ah, uh, let me get back to you. You know, I asked you, what was your name? You know, let me, let me, it's just, you can't think straight, right? Your body's present, but your mind is not. Uh, another symptom is very little motivation. You used to have drive, you used to have passion, you used to pursue things and you just, you've lost it. You're like emotionally numb. As hard as you try, you just can't engage. Uh, lack of productivity. You're busy, your schedule is packed, but you just feel like you're not getting anything of significant done. You, you're not very productive. Uh, another one is, is a limited attention to self-care. Or you stop taking care of yourself emotionally or physically or relationally. If you're honest, you're, you're finding yourself becoming weaker and weaker in areas you used to be really strong. It's a sign of burnout. This next one's a, a, a big one, and I'm actually going to pause for a little bit, and I want to talk about this, but ongoing exhaustion. We can only live on the treadmill of performance for so long. In, in our culture, this is what we do, right? Life's all about what we can accumulate and accomplish and achieve. And if we stay on this treadmill for too long, inevitably, we're going to become tired. We're going to become mentally tired, emotionally tired, physically tired, and we're going to be burned out. And when people burn out, man, their life just seems to fall apart. And it's not because they don't love God. There are people who deeply, deeply, deeply love God, and yet they burned out. In fact, in our Bible, uh, in, in the first part of our Bible, there's the biography of a guy by the name of Job. Right? And at the start of Job's story, here's what we learn about Job. That there was once a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. Right? It kind of feels like this Disney story that's unfolding. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. Now, regardless of how you define success, Job was successful. Job loved God. He was an honorable man. He had a large family. His family loved him. He loved them. He was a hard worker. He was blessed in resources. Uh, he had lots of resources. He had a great reputation. I mean, Job was a great dude. But then he went through a season of extreme loss. And quite honestly, at the start of the season, he's got a pretty good attitude. I mean, he lost family members. He lost wealth. He, you know, people to death. He, he, he uh, lost uh, wealth and health. And it just, and at the start of that season, here, here's what he says. He says, the Lord gave me what I had and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. Makes you wonder if Job was taking gummies, right? Like he's living in some la-la land. Like, are, are you not able to see and experience the reality of life? You lose family members, you're losing your health, you're sick as can be, you, 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 your wealth and your resources, you, you've lost them, you don't have insurance, and yet he has this amazing perspective. The Lord gave me what I had, the Lord took it away, blessed be his name, right? Honor to his name, praise be to his name. But here's the deal, as hours turn into days, and then days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into months, it starts to change Job's perspective. And eventually Job comes to this conclusion. I'd rather die than suffer like this. I hate my life and don't want to go on living. He goes from one extreme to the other. He said, oh, man, God gave me what I have. Praise his name. Oh. But man, he stays in this week after week, month after month. And it's just too much. And eventually he 
turns to one of his friends and he admits, he says, depression haunts my days. Do not miss this. Most of us are prepared for days and weeks of disappointment. We're prepared for days and weeks of hurt and loss, but most of us are not prepared for months or years of disappointment and hurt and pain and loss. And so inevitably, it catches up. That's what happened to Job. He said, I love God, but I'm done. I can't do this. God, if this is what you, you, you intend for my life to look like, I'd just rather die than go on living. It's burnout. That's, that's what he was. He was burned out. Another symptom of burnout is when we are drained by almost everybody. And I know some of you would be like, that, that's my life, Dave. I don't like talking to people. I don't like looking at people, right? I just want to stay home all the time, right? But this is when you get to the point in your life where the people you liked, you don't even like anymore. Or the people you enjoy being around, you don't even enjoy being around because they drain you. You feel like everybody wants something from you. Nobody's ever grateful. That's burnout. One of the most loved people in all of Jewish history is Moses, right? And the reason why is because uh, Moses was a huge uh, figure in, in, in their uh, nation's history because uh, early on in their history, uh, the Jewish people were slaves in Egypt for more than 400 years. And Moses was the leader who, by God's power, uh, led them out of Egypt. And they settled in in the desert, and that's where God began to form them as a nation. But here's the leader. Uh, here's the, the, the reality of all this. Moses was the leader who led them out. Moses was the leader there in the desert. And days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into months, and months turn into years. And Moses was never able to escape the pressure of leadership. Constantly dealing with people's difficult personalities. He's settling disputes. He's trying to keep people motivated and focused on what they were supposed to be doing. Well, eventually it catches up to him. He's burned out. And we know this because of a prayer that he prayed. It's recorded for us. Here's what Moses prayed. God, I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me. Do me a favor and spare me this misery. You ever prayed that prayer? Like, God, if this is what you intend for my life, just, it's, I am done. When you're burned out, the people you love the most, you get angry at, you get irritated at, you don't even like them anymore. And that's what happened to Moses. Another major symptom of burnout, and there's plenty more, but these are the ones I just wanted to allude to today, but it's when we become overly emotional. Right? Burnout messes with our emotions. Sometimes it results in irrational fear where we feel like everything's falling apart. We just can't think clearly. Right? It's almost like we're living on edge all the time where little things all of a sudden turn into big arguments. You're getting into unnecessary conflict. That's what happens when we're burned out. So you just want to fight everybody. It's like, you know, you're just mad at the world. This is when you look at your spouse who's chewing gum and you see it not as annoying anymore. You see it as a major character flaw in their life. They, that they got to deal with, right? And think about, think about King David, right? Second king of Israel. David had a reputation for being a man after God's own heart. That's one of the phrases attached to him. Man after God's own heart, love God, trusted God. He wrote more about the faithfulness of God than anyone else. He wrote lots and lots of songs of worship and, and praise. In fact, uh, one of the songs of worship he wrote is recorded for us in Psalm 100. Here are some of the lyrics. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. And his faithfulness continues to each generation. Now, if you know anything about David, this was not a fake expression of worship. This is how David genuinely felt like, I love God. He's faithful. He's good. He watches over me. But there were many seasons of David's life where he was burned out. There were seasons of David's life in which he spent a whole lot of time living in the desert running from his enemies, living in caves, fighting off wild animals. And in one of those seasons, here's what he wrote in his journal. He says, I am worn out from sobbing. All night, I flood my bed with weeping, drenching it with my tears. My vision is blurred by grief. My eyes are worn out because of all my enemies. He was just overly emotional. Burnout was just messing with him. In another ongoing season of difficulty, David wrote these words in his journal. He, he, he asked a question. He says, oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? 
So here's David always writing about the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, how God protects us, watches over us. And now he's like, oh God, where are you? That's what burnout does. Makes it almost impossible for David to see and feel and know God. Which is why we have to continually be on guard to resist and to strike down, right? Anything that works to deplete our time and our energy and our emotional resources. We defined it earlier, but let's do it again. Burnout is when the demands placed on us exceed the resources within us. And what burnout will do is it will cause us to feel like we're living in a fog. And all of us live in fogs from time to time, but if we live in that season for too long, if we go too long without being able to see or think clearly, eventually, I'm telling you, it's inevitable. We will make decisions that bring destruction into our lives. So the question is, how do we strike down the moles that try to attack us? Or how do we strike down the things that should deplete us? How do we strike down the things that do destruction in our life? Well, there's probably a lot of things we can do, but I think sometimes when you're in a season of burnout, you don't want to know a lot of things. Or you just give me a couple things and then just choose one. So that's all I'm going to ask you to do, choose one. I'm going to talk about three. Here we go. Number one, find life-giving things to fill me up. Taking care of myself, ensuring I'm healthy, is the most important thing I can do. And the reason why is because I bring myself everywhere I go. I bring myself into my marriage. I bring myself into my parenting. I bring myself in a career. I bring myself as a pastor. I bring myself everywhere I go. And if I'm not healthy, it impacts everybody. I have to find life-giving things to fill me up. There's an old children's song that I learned from Sesame Street when I was growing up. It was sung by puppets known, uh, they were known as the Anything Muppets, all right? And the song was called, There's a Hole in My Bucket. I don't know if you remember this, right? Song, it's a dialogue, even though it's a song, it's a dialogue that unfolds between Henry and his wife, Liza, all right? And it's centered around this bucket that has a hole in it. And so he looks at his wife and he says, there's a hole in my bucket, dear Liza, dear Liza. There's a hole in my bucket, dear Liza, a hole. Now, Henry doesn't have any common sense because she says, well, fix it. And then he responds, well, what should I fix it with? And she says, and the song just keeps going back and forth, uh, well, fix it with stick or straw. So he goes, finds a stick. He says, well, it's not the right size. And she says, well, cut it. He says, well, what should I cut it with? And she says, with a knife. He says, but the knife's too dull. I mean, this guy can't think on his own. And so he, 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 she says, well, well, if it's too dull, then go sharpen it. He goes, well, how should I sharpen it? She goes, against the stone. He goes, but the stone's too dry. And then his argument is, well, or her argument is, well, then make sure it gets wet. He says, well, how do I put, get it wet? Well, with the water. Well, how do I fetch the water? With the bucket. And it goes back to the beginning of the song. There's a hole in my bucket. Dear Liza, dear Liza, there's a hole in my bucket. Dear Liza, a hole. Every one of us have holes in the bucket of our life, right? Things that drain us. And if we have more things that are draining us than filling us up, we are in trouble. And temptation but the holes in life is to just try to slow the leaks. Because if we slow the leaks, then we'll be refreshed. No, we won't. It's helpful to slow the leaks. Let's slow down our schedule. Let's say no to things. That's important. But if we do not find things to fill us up, I'm telling you, we're in trouble. And, and it looks different in different seasons of our life. Right now, one of the things that fills me up is hanging out with my adult kids. Right? Now, I've got a 17-year-old son. That fills me up as well. But I'm telling you, when my girls were teenagers, it did not fill me up. It drained me. But it fills me up now. Going on date nights with my wife fills me up. There were seasons that did not fill me up. <laughs> Hanging out with friends, hunting, going hiking, kayaking fills me up. Certain types of books, reading can fill me up. Diet and exercise, they're not fun, <laughs> but they do fill me up. I have to discipline myself to do those things. But I know at the end of the day, it helps me be healthier. Something else that I can do to strike down the things that lead to burnout, I can take responsibility for, is to learn how to embrace the season I'm in. See, the tension that all of us experience in life, right, is we try to balance everything perfectly. And, and so it's like, man, I, I got to have perfect time at, at my work, okay, and, and, and perfect time with my, my kids, and, and perfect time with my spouse, and hold on, perfect time for myself, and if I could, whoa, 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 whoa. No, nobody move, nobody move, okay, well, let's, let's just get this perfect, right, and, and, and so we're just trying to have this perfect balance in life, problem is that's not realistic, because life is not static, you know that, 
Life's constantly moving and evolving and changing. So we have to be sensitive to the season of life that we're in. So we have to really pay attention to the fulcrum, right? The thing that everything balances on. There's gonna be times in life where you sense God's saying, hey, you, you need to put more time toward your family in this season. And that's okay. That, that's, that's where you put your, your attention and your focus in that season. And then there are gonna be other seasons where I put, put, put your attention at work right now. You really need it. And you just move it and you try to pay attention to what, what, what God would have you do in that season. But do not buy into the lie that, oh, if I could just get everything balanced perfectly, this is how I'm going to live my life. I'm just, oh. No, that's not, that's not realistic. There's always going to be stuff to do. Always going to be stuff to do. And burnout will occur when we have this undisciplined pursuit in our life for just more and more and more all the time. I've talked on several occasions about how 2017 was a year of burnout for me. Complete burnout. Our church in Kenosha, our Kenosha campus had moved seven times. Our Racine campus had lost a campus pastor. It's trying to manage that. It was a crazy year. I'm not going to get into the details because I've done that before. But during that season, on several different occasions, I looked at my wife and I said with so much emotion, I am not the leader this church needs right now. But I'm the only leader they got. So either A, I need to resign so they can get a better leader. Or B, I need to go take care of myself so I can be a better leader. And I can be the leader they need. And I chose to do that. And I chose to be the leader that the church needed. And I chose to be the husband my wife needed and the father my kids needed. But I'm telling you, it was a lot of work because the pressure was always, you need more time at work, more time at work. And that season is all about work, 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 work. But I was dying inside. One of the biggest things I did to kind of focus and help myself get healthy is I started inviting more people to speak. This is when I started inviting Kirby to speak more and Skylar to speak more and people that you've grown to love, right? Because I, up until then, I was speaking 48 times a year. I was getting drained emotionally and mentally. It was hard to just keep up writing messages week after week after week. And so I started relying on other people. That was hard to do. And, and this summer, man, I'm inviting more of my friends. I'm saying, man, I want to introduce you. I know you've been introduced to Jeremiah, but I'm introducing you to more friends because I think it's healthy for you and it's healthy for me. Uh, uh, you know, learning to rely on others because the first couple of years of the church is all about Dave has to answer this and Dave, you direct this and Dave, you decide that. And that's okay. You're starting a church. You're setting the DNA. You're setting the direction. You're setting the culture. But long after that was necessary, I was still making the decisions. I should have been handing them off. And so I had to learn how to rely on other people. And during that time, 2017, I learned that anytime I feel growing pressure and stress in my life, I need to ensure I'm taking care of myself. I am self-aware enough now to know that if I live in a fog for too long, it's going to result in disaster. And almost did, right? With my marriage, almost did with just me even caring about the church anymore. I'm just saying never again. One more way that I just want to kind of pass on that we can strike down the things that lead to burnout is we can plan rest into our lives, right? The reason my marriage is healthy today, the reason that our church is healthy, right? The reason that I feel like with confidence we're moving forward is because we've, uh, I personally, but I know, uh, you know, uh, some of the people even in leadership have, have done their best to, to put these rhythms into life. Jesus built a rhythm of rest into his life. If anyone could have excused himself for being too busy, it would have been Jesus. Everybody wanted something from him, right? Wanted his attention, wanted his focus, wanted his advice. God, you know, Jesus, come heal my child. Jesus, do this for me. And here's the deal. As he grew in popularity, here's what we read about Jesus. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. I want you to hear this. People do not mess up their life because they're evil. It's because they're frail. They mess up their life because they're tired. They're not thinking clearly. I'm convinced people do not forget that they're teachers, that they're husbands, their wives. People don't forget that they're someone's child, that there's someone, right, there's someone's parent, there's someone's employee, they're the employer. But we forget all the time that we're human. And whenever I personally see someone burn out morally or ethically, I'm telling you the honest truth. I do not lead from a position of judgment in those seasons. I don't look at them with deep judgment. I look at them with a lot of empathy. 
Because most people I know want to be a great parent. They want to be a great spouse. They want to be a great employer, a great employee. But the moles of life just keep popping up. More to do, more to accomplish, more to achieve. And without realizing it, these moles start doing destruction in lives. People start getting burned out. And they start living in a fog and they start making decisions that eventually lead to destruction. We need rest. When we are physically rested, it is easier for us to feel renewed emotionally and intellectually and relationally. Guys, this is why every single year in between our Christmas Eve service and the new year, we take it all off. Usually 10 days, sometimes 12 days, we take it all off. When we first started doing that, I had pastor friends like, you're irresponsible as a pastor to ever take a Sunday off, to ever take a Wednesday off. But we did it, why? Because you need rest. Our staff needs rest. Our volunteers need rest. I need rest. And then last year, we went crazy. We took Memorial Day off. The Sunday, right before Memorial Day, right? We took it off. And I had friends that said, Dave, don't do it. You lose momentum. It's not responsible. But you need time off. I need time off. Our volunteers need time off. Our staff needs time off. Because we plan on doing this for a very, very, very long time. We need rest. And those who are clapping are those who volunteer every single week. <laughs> Disciple John wrote several letters in the first century. And one of those letters, here's what he tells his readers. He says, dear friend, I hope all is well with you in that you are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. If you want to be strong in spirit, the most spiritual thing you can do is get rest. Well, I thought it's, I could read the scripture. The most spiritual thing I can do is probably pray. It's probably serve others. Listen, if you are not rested and you're exhausted, you can read scriptures all you want, but it's not going to connect with you. If you're exhausted, it's going to be almost impossible to pray. If you're exhausted, when you serve others, you're just going to become cynical. But nobody is going to force you to rest. You have to decide to do it. And sometimes this idea of rest in our culture gets a little bit abused. Right? I've seen people use it as an excuse for laziness. Right? Some of the people that, I talk, that, that talk most about burnout are the ones that I just want to look at and say, believe me, you, you don't have to worry about burning out. Right? You're still living with your mom. She's cooking your meals and tucking you in at night. You do not have to worry about burnout right? But they get triggered by the letters J-O-B. It's like, oh, I don't want to think about it, right? It's like, don't worry, right? But a lot of us who don't think about it need to be worried about it. So when it comes to rest, we have taught this before. We should divert daily, right? Find something, just divert our attention, get a little, you know, have a little laugh, watch a TV show, do something. Withdraw weekly, take a day off, and abandon annually. Like, get out, have a vacation, I can't afford a vacation. Do a staycation and close your eyes and pretend you're in Hawaii and just uh, enjoy. <laughs> I'm responsible for me. I need to find things that fill me up. Life-giving things, right? I need to embrace the season of life I am and I need to plan rest into my life. So when it comes down to striking the moles in this life, right? The things that attack our time and our energy and our resources. One of the things that I need to remind myself of and you need to remind yourself of so important is ultimately I'm in charge of me. You can pray for me, you can be concerned for me, but you know, at the end of the day, you're not gonna watch out for me as much as I need to be watched out for. So I have to do it. And as much as you would like someone to watch out for you, I'm not gonna be doing that for you. All of us have a front stage life and a backstage life, right? And the front stage life is what everybody sees. You're walking around the lobby, you're smiling, you're, you're, you go to work, it's, it's like the spotlight. Everybody sees what you do, everybody sees what you're capable of, your talents, all that stuff. We all have a front stage life, but we also have a backstage life. That's our private world. That's the part nobody sees. That's the part that impacts our character and our emotions and our relationships. And if I'm not paying attention to the backstage of my life, the front stage will unintentionally, accidentally just become a facade. It's gonna be fake. I'm gonna start living in a fog. And if I live that way for too long, I'm telling you inevitably, at some point, I'm gonna start making destructive decisions. And here's the deal, when I burn out, it's gonna be easy to blame a lot of people. Oh, I'm blame my employer, blame my family, right? blame people who ask things of me, but ultimately, I'm in charge of me, and you're in charge of you. Now, if you're in a season of burnout, if you feel exhausted, if you feel almost hopeless, like you'll ever get out of that season, please do not lose hope. If you are a follower of Jesus, don't lose hope. I talked about this last week. Our faith constantly points us to a hopeful future. When everyone else sees an ending, we see a beginning. When everyone else sees death, we see life. We see the possibility of a resurrection. So Moses burned out. He wanted to die, but he found ways to put up boundaries. He found ways to share the burdens of life and leadership. He found ways to renew physically and emotionally and relationally. And eventually he was able to find the strength to 
lead the Jewish people for 40 years. Same with Job. He's like, God, this is, this is it. Just let me die. He was, he was rock bottom. He was depressed. But he, he had some people come alongside him, supported him, and eventually he entered into a new season. Here's what we read at the end of Job's biography. So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life, even more than in the beginning. Same with King David, right? Hit rock bottom, felt like God had rejected him. God wasn't listening to him. And at the end of his life, he looks back and he writes Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. That's what God wants to do for you and he wants to do for me. And he wants to free us. Life does not have to be a tireless effort to establish ourselves and justify ourselves and validate ourselves. He wants to free us from the weight and the pressure that all of us feel. This is why he says, come to me, all of you who are tired. You're carrying heavy burdens. I want to give you rest. And this is what it looks like to put our faith in Jesus. It's to say, hey, I'm not putting my confidence in me. It's in you. And because you won, I'm free to lose. Because you're extraordinary, I can be ordinary. Right? Because you did something, I don't have to do anything, and I still have value and worth. And I'm not going to spend my life on this treadmill that leads to burnout. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promise that you have come to give us life and life to the fullest. Give us wisdom to identify the various moles, the various enemies, the various threats that want to destroy us and take away our energy and cause burnout in our life. And give us the wisdom to know how to strike those things down. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us here at Great Lakes Church. Again, my name is Carson, and I'm so glad that you chose to share some time with us this week. We hope something in this talk was meaningful to you, encouraging to you, and maybe even something worth writing down that you can go share with a friend. If you'd like to get involved, maybe join us at one of our physical locations in Southeast Wisconsin, or just be a part of our many other goings on on our social platforms or events in the area, check out greatlakeschurch.com.